Often it's a female shape, but in this it's a male. Now, if you remember when you saw it before the fiber was laid on, you had those uh, changes in the geometry shape. And now what's important is that we get the fiber tight into those inner radiuses and forming, as it were, loosely but not fluffy loosely. What we don't want to do is the point is to pull it tight around the radiuses. We want the fiber to fill the mold cross-sectionally. The part thickness has to have the fiber touching the bottom of the mold as well as the top of the mold, which is the upper half. And you'll see here now as Don continues how what he's doing now is trimming where the overlaps are so those overlaps will will low will cross each other about an inch. It's a little bit difficult from your camera angle to see, but he's giving the darting on the side to bring that overlap in place about an inch of an overlap. So go ahead and carry on, Don. I'd like to point out that Don's doing all this cutting on the molding, as it were. He, he could have, and if we were set up for production of this part, he would have had this more cut to shape, as it were. It would be with a template using masonite uh, or some uh, materials, often masonite or plexiglass is used, and most of these cuts would have then been in place already. Now, though these materials stretch, you can't necessarily die cut it to the exact shape you'd want, which would significantly reduce the time. But what we're showing here is basically as though it were the first time the part had been loaded. And so the time shown in this elapsed molding is not optimized. But the point is being made. What we'd like to show is the careful nature of the overlaps and then paying attention to detail, loading it into those radiuses, making sure the fibers form. See, the biggest myth of our industry is that the closure of the mold pushes the glass right in where it needs to be. That is wrong. You must form the glass to the mold shape and the mold closure will just allow the touching of the two surfaces, the lower which the glass is against and the upper coming in contact with the glass. It's wrong to assume that the upper will force the glass into place. It can't push the glass ahead. The best it could do is pull it tight to itself. So it's important to get it formed correctly at this stage. All right, now Don's just finishing up the perimeter trim around the flange of the, of the molding. And uh, he'll just, as you'll see here in a moment, he'll wipe the flange clean of any loose fibers that would be caught under the seal. And then we'll close the mold and begin our injection. In preparation for closing of the mold, we need to in insert the vacuum line that will communicate vacuum to the cavity, which Don's putting in now. And that line will pass through the Teflon sleeve and come up flush to the inside surface of the mold cavity. So he's pressing it through. Now, Again, in production, you would have had that preloaded into the nile, into the Teflon inserted sleeve, and you would have slipped that in as an assembly. But as he's doing it here as a one-time shot, he's, he's slipping that in now and confirming its position. Now what he'll do is insert the injection tube. Now this tube is, is the tube that will communicate the resin into the mold during injection, and then we'll just simply pinch that tube off in the end, allow the resin to cure, and you'll see in the end we'll just simply pull that tube out and that's the disposable injection sprue, as it were. A uh, very cost-effective way to communicate the mix head to the mold and then have a very easy to clean injection sprue. That too is inserted through the injection sleeve till it's flush on the inside of the mold. So Don's right hand there is feeling on the inside that the end of the tube is flush with the top of the mold. All right, with that in place, we're ready to close the mold and begin the injection. I'll give you a hand there, Don. I'll help you load that. Okay, you saw that we had some over center clamps. Those uh, just give us a chance to get the seals to engage. And then the yellow line that Don's about to connect will connect to the perimeter flange that circumvents the mold. Now that flange, you'll see the gauge there on the right side of the mold, 
will indicate that the flange vacuum has achieved the level we're looking for. And we want at least 23 inches of clamping vacuum force around the mold, kind of like a suction cup around the outer perimeter of the mold, which is being communicated through that yellow line. In a moment here, you'll see that gauge indicate the vacuum has, has been turned on and is down under vacuum. So there you can see the mold vacuum coming up, the gauge is coming around, and it'll settle in at about 23 inches of vacuum, which is what we have it set to. So what that's doing is giving us an outer perimeter vacuum that helps hold the mold closed. At this point, those clamps are virtually not doing anything at all. Now the blue line represents a regulated vacuum. So what you'll see Don doing is he's connecting the blue line to a catch pot. The catch pot there, that blue line, could actually be connected to the mold there at the top. However, if we were to draw resin up into that blue line, we'd potentially draw it into the regulator and up into the vacuum system. 